Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. So I'm Jamin Ferguson. As I mentioned before, I work as a front-end engineer on AWS supply chain, um, doing some sustainability features. Previously worked as a developer advocate at PayPal and um, worked at PayPal as a JavaScript engineer for a bunch of years. And um, yeah, and previous to that, so I sort of skipped around. Um, I also have worked at Amazon doing a bunch of web performance stuff. And so a lot of the details from this come from my last in Amazon when I was more in a web performance focused role. Um, but I, I wanted to have like an angle to take this because just like a straight tech talk is good and fine, but I wanted to make it more fun. So I wanted to go with monsters. I originally did this talk, maybe it was around like Halloween or something. I don't know where I got it, but I kind of stuck with it. So thing about monsters is to learn how to like defeat a monster and like thinking of like movie monsters and all this stuff they kind of have like a certain like lore or like a certain like you've got to kind of learn the the secret ways the mystical ways of defeating the monsters this is this is the vibe i want you to get in okay for the talk it's a little bit silly but it's going to be good um so you probably like learn their weaknesses learn learn all the kind of details, and then you can defeat them. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different types of monsters. Some of these come from different movies, the cute mummies I generated with Mid Journey like yesterday, and I thought they looked really nice. Um, and I'll kind of compare these to different types of web performance problems that people are having. Um, some of you may have had some of these issues. Let's start with the abominable. How many of you actually seen this movie? I think this is an American thing, and it, it's, it's not going to hit so well here. This is like the classic Christmas uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And they go, and they've got this uh, abominable snowman out in the mountains, you know, that eats everything and gets all the snow. And I think of him as the abominable bundler. Uh, he's called the bumbler in the show, but bundler. And I just think about um, Webpack, okay? I know, I know, this is like, you got you to gotta work with me here. You got to get into it. Um, when I was at PayPal, this message, this is a fake person, but this basic message came into like our JavaScript channel in Slack. Uh, just take a second to think about this for a second. Uh, what it's saying there. Uh, people think this way, right? Like people often say, there's a problem. I guess we have to refactor a whole, I throw away our whole app and refactor it and start over. And like, like I'm not like, I use React mostly, but I'm not like a, you know, obsessed with React or think like, oh yeah, everyone should be jumping on the same train that I'm on. But I just like, it made me cringe so bad uh, when I saw this. And uh, you know, you probably think like nine megabytes, like this is very large. Like just to put it in perspective, like your like initial bundle size maybe should be 500K, 250, right? Like um, it should not be, Nine, like, like obviously it's too big. Uh, so we, we started looking at it with Webpack Bundle Analyzer and um, basically like uh, anything look like weird here for a JavaScript app. Uh, like they're having uh, something like seven megabytes of SVG files just like bundled up in their Webpack. And like they didn't like split it out or anything. It's just like, Here's all the SVGs in the whole world, and we're gonna serve it up with your JavaScript file. Just to do something sort of vaguely like this, right? Like a country selector, like pick your thing, which like only shows up when you click on a thing anyway. So like you absolutely never need that for the first page. And okay, so this was, this is like gave me feelings. And so, and, and then the second thing is, um, this is a picture from Stranger Things 4, by the way, if you didn't, if you can't, didn't catch the reference. But, like, the idea is you think, like, moving is going to solve your problems, right? Like, oh, we're just going to move. Like, oh, we're going to move to React. Yeah, well, guess what they're going to bring with them? There's their stupid, like, uh, flag library, right? So, like, you, you can't just run away from your problems. And I do feel like it's very convenient for engineers who want to run to, like, whatever's the cool framework of the day to be like, we're going to go to... Uh, remix and it's gonna make everything fast. It's like not if you are the problem like not if you are the thing that is slow um, So what do you do when you have a nine megabyte JavaScript bundle you need to look at a bundle analyzer This is the one that comes with webpack If you're using like Vite, you can use the roll-up plugin visualizer if you're using Remix you can use the ES build bundle analyzer like there's there's tools for this problem. 
And I have an old article from 2016 about tuning Webpack builds, but it covers a lot of the same issues of how to identify when you um, have random junk in your JavaScript bundle um, and how to chip away from that. This is like the greatest character ever, but if you haven't seen the show, it's not, it's not, it doesn't really work. Um, he's called Yukon Cornelius. Anyway, um, so some, some tips for this one, for this particular defeating this monster, take advantage of code splitting. Uh, you know, focus on like big chunks. What, what we found, like every time I start looking in the bundle analyzer, we have like five different like uh, like promise uh, polyfills and like two different versions of fetch. And like I always spend like way too much time like getting those out. And then it's like, wow, you shaved off three kilobytes. You know, like it doesn't really matter. So like, you really want to look at like the big stuff. Oops, I included all of Lodash. That's a mega mega and a half. And I'm only using uh, the is equal method. Like mm -hmm. like look for the big stuff. Um, and then it's important, if you are doing code splitting, it's important to look at not only the individual size of each file, but also like, what's the total? Like, if, the per, if you're gonna have to load three files to get your page and those files are a meg and a half, you, you've still done a bad thing. So, a couple tips for defeating the, um, the, bu the, bum the bumble or snowman. Uh, let's move on to the next one, which is gonna be about Dracula. This is like a bit of a stretch on the name, but like, hear me out. Dracula is like kind of a stylish monster wearing a suit looking cool. So I decided to talk about CSS uh, with Dracula. And this is, sorry, you can go back. If you want the picture, I'll go, oh no. I'm pressing the wrong button. There you go. Uh, I used to work at Amazon. I currently work at Amazon, but I also used to work at Amazon. And it, when I worked on there before, it wasn't for AWS, where I'm very bad with lambdas and things, but that's like what we're doing now. Um, but before I was working on Seller Central, which is if you want to sell your product, you know when you go to Amazon and it's like buying from like some other random person, and it's like it's kind of annoying. Like you want you want like the good shipping, you don't want the like slow shipping. Anyway, that's that's what I was working on, letting people sell their stuff. It's cool. About half the products, right, are coming from third-party sellers. So we were building this form. Uh, which isn't very exciting. Turns out I'm now building a form also. Like building forms is an important part of the web. But we were building a form where people could put in information about the products that they wanted to sell. And you can imagine like the web page where you sell stuff on Amazon.com, like there's like an absurd amount of information there. Like how much does it weigh? Like what countries can you have this product in? Like what's the description? What kind of pictures do you have? So we have to have like right all of these things. And every single product category had a different, um, well, you can imagine, just different questions, you know? Like, like if you're having luggage, we have to ask, like, does it have batteries? Because some batteries can, like, go. Like, you can, you can sit on them and they can go. There's just, like, weird stuff. And we have to, like, know every possible thing about every product. Okay. We knew that it was slow. Like, we were gorging on the banquet of NPM, just, like, taking in all those modules, right? And then we also had monitoring. And our monitoring was like telling us, yeah, your website is slow if you're like on a bad connection and it's pretty slow if you're on a fast connection. So it was like pretty much just letting us know that we did a bad job. And we use tools like Lighthouse. How many of you have heard of Lighthouse or are familiar with Lighthouse? Great. So Lighthouse performance tool. And it, the thing is you run Lighthouse and you get like 4,000 suggestions. Like it just tells you that everything you've done is bad <laughs> and you should feel bad. And, and in our particular case, it says you should remove unused CSS. And like, here's the thing, right? Like you have a big CSS file. You're like, oh, just take out the bits that you don't need. But like, what's the magic to figure out the bits that you don't need, right? Like how does one do that exactly? So I sat on that. I got that. I, I worked there and I was like, hey, I joined the team and I was like, I know our website is bad, but I'm like pretty good at making them faster. And I would run Lighthouse and I'm like, hey, do you know that this is bad? I'm like, okay, so what, what should we do about it? And I was like, well, I don't really know how to just like perfectly remove all the things that we don't need. <laughs> One day, I was sitting on Twitter, and um, Adi Smani posts this thing about the CSS coverage tool, which is like really what I needed to see, because I didn't realize that this is built into Chrome. Um, like I knew that there are third-party tools you could run and blah, 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 but like it's right there in the dev tools. Um, excuse me. Uh, you can get the coverage for both your CSS and JavaScript, and so what this does is it will tell you how much of the CSS files or JavaScript files that we've loaded are actually in use on this page. And so you get this thing, you run it, it shows you, this is just like a random website. It shows you like percentages, there's like little 
things. And the thing about CSS, right? Like CSS is a render blocking resource, okay? Think about that for a second. Until the CSS is downloaded, parsed, and like the, the CSS uh, object model is like all ready to apply to your site, like it's not gonna render anything. So it's waiting, if you have that CSS in your head, like linked there, it's not gonna show the page until the CSS is ready because it knows it's gonna have to change how it looks. And so if you have like lots of extra stuff in there, right, like it's just gonna be really, really slow for your website. Keep this in mind, like just sprinkle in your CSS, like don't overdo it. That was mid journey, by the way. It, like, it was like a little too hardcore on the, on the sprinkles, to be honest. I wanted a lighter one, but you can't control it all. Uh, so, so I went through our page, I ran the thing, and um, I was like, you know, I, we could probably do better, you know? Turns out, we were using 1% uh, of our CSS, just 1%, so 99% of it, and this is like going through multiple pages, whatever, 1%. Um, and our CSS file was two megabytes. So I was complaining about the nine megabyte JavaScript file, but JavaScript isn't render blocking in the same way. So like the page will at least show up uh, while it's trying to download the JavaScript. Like the whole website is just blocking for this two megabyte. And we had a lot of customers like all throughout the world and China and different places. And we're like, what are we doing making it so slow for them? So then it became this great like hunt to fit mid journey picture. Uh, just some detective looking at the computer seriously. Um, it became to figure out how, where is the CSS coming from? Because it said remove the CSS. I saw the coverage. You could just go down and scroll through and like, yeah, I'm not using this, I'm not using this, I'm not using this. But then it was like, but where does that code live? And so I spent like probably day, like literally days going through and I'm like, is it in this random SAS file? Is it in the node modules? Like grepping through the node modules, like trying to find the source of this magical megabytes. Um, it was very annoying. And eventually <laughs> I found these two lines in like our like main.jsx file, right? And I just like, just look at this. And you know, I saw these lines all the time, all the time, because it's in like the main file. It's like the first file, like it, it like links to these two uh, lines. Anything weird stand out here? Like anything at all? Yeah. We got the minified and the unminified version. So we have the big one and the small one. Uh, but like I looked at that for real and I saw that and I'm like, like basically the team was like mostly backend engineers. They inherited this app. They hired me as like the first front end engineer. And I came out and I'm like, look, this is pretty weird, but like I'm sure they knew what they're doing. Like I don't want to be like, the new guy that comes in and tells them that they like do everything wrong, but like, turns out. Uh, so the first thing I did is like, let's just comment out like everything and just like see. And like, weirdly enough, the web page is still like kind of loaded, just like everything was like in weird places. Cause like, totally, the thing is, this is like the semantic UI. Like we had, like all of our stuff was built on top of some like internal Amazon UI library. Like this is just like extra fluff in there. Um, we didn't even need it. So, so then I started like poking around and like in the coverage thing, you can see like what is used. So instead of looking at what's not used, which was just all of it, I started looking at like what is the actual things that we're using from this library. And it turns out there was like, like there was like the grid system. So this is like, okay, before like Flexbox, well, not before Flexbox, but before like um, CSS, like um, grid and like modern new things. There was tabs and there was dialog boxes. So like three components. This is the, the mega and a half like library of CSS that we're bringing in. And we're using like, like about six like, grid tags, like the tabs and the dialog boxes. And the cool thing was like, not only were we having this UI library, we were also having like a, a secondary UI library from like the internal Amazon one, just like stacking them up, you know, just like getting as many UIs as we can in there. And um, because we already had grids, I literally could just like search and replace, like place the one grid with the other grid. Call it. So the first thing I did is I commented out one line, that was 700K, just like smoothed right off. And then once I replaced all the other stuff, we ended up, I mean, the website was 700 milliseconds faster after we just got rid of that CSS file. It took about a month for one of our um, new team members to go through and like carefully re replace it. 
but it saved so much time. Like all of our metrics, like we, we were, that team was like astoundingly good at keeping track of all the metrics. They were like, uh, I mean, it just like, it just like, like so much. Like it just like moved all of our stuff, like from like red to yellow or from yellow to green, just deleting CSS file. It was, it was really amazing. So just the thought, like most people aren't gonna have this problem, but like, this isn't the first time that I've had multiple UI libraries. Like in my, that time we had three because we pulled in the same one twice, which is just like amazing. But like, cause it's, it's, it's good because when you take it out, like it makes you look like you did some hard thing, even though I just commented out like a line basically. Um, but my thoughts on this are, um, you know, keep an eye on percentage, coverage percentage for CSS. You can't just go and rip out everything cause you might use it on a different screen or whatever. There's tools like CSS for, how many of you use Tailwind? Not so popular, but Tailwind popularized this idea of CSS purge where it basically like reads all your files and like figures out what classes you need and will actually remove from your CSS file classes that aren't in use. So there's different tools you can use, but like especially look at like pulling in an entire UI library. It's almost always the wrong idea. So that's how we're gonna beat Dracula. All these animations are too too slow. Next, I wanna talk about some outdated, legacy, ancient code. How many of y'all have been using jQuery before? Okay, half. The um, thing that I learned when I was kind of working on this is that as of last year, jQuery is 15 times more popular than React, according to you know, like actual website usage in reality. So yes, many, many, many websites are built in React, but just imagine like many more websites maybe are built on older versions of WordPress or different things that just primarily use jQuery plugins to run themselves. And maybe in some cases they, these numbers aren't correct, but you get the basic idea is that somehow in 2023, learning how to analyze and optimize a jQuery page is actually like possibly a relevant skill. So after I did some work on our team, um, I got invited to help out some of the other teams in Seller Central to make their websites faster. And I was like feeling good about myself because I was like, I understood the React stuff. I understood how to make that faster. And then they shoved me into this page with like MoMA.js, jQuery UI, Java server pages, like Require.js. How many use Require.js? Oh, this is like the old school people. Like before Webpack, before Browserify, like this is how they used to do like lazy loading stuff. And it was really, really cool. Um, like code splitting, like before, it like circled back and became a thing again, require JS, oof. So the thing is when you get in a situation like this and you're like, I think this website is slow, but it's using like a really outdated technology stack. What do you do? What's your go-to? Any, any thoughts on like, how do you think about making it fast? I'm looking for a shout out. You got everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what everyone's gonna say. Well, if I just rebuild this in React, it'll be faster. And the funny thing is we measured things so well, but we found that teams rebuilt their old stack in React, it usually ended up slower, um, which was a bummer. Yeah. Yeah, let's see, let's see for, the, for the old school like jQuery heads if they can figure out what, what was the problem here. So we, we, uh, my, my suggestion is if you're dealing with a site you don't understand, always start with the performance tab in the web inspector. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious answer. It's like, oh, performance is bad? Try the performance tab. Like it, it's in the name, but you go and record your interactions in a page, and it's gonna show you these really pretty colorful charts that show you how much time each function took and how much time each sub function took. It's just like, it's a beautiful thing. And what we found with this page, because remember, we knew it was slow, not because it felt particularly slow, like it didn't feel sluggish, but we have, um, we had like SLAs and um, we'd measure uh, time to first byte and time to interactive and some of this stuff. This is kind of pre like Chrome Web Vitals. So it was kind of like our own custom metrics. We use a tool called Boomerang, which has been around for ages to try and measure like when the website was available and working. And, and, and this just page kept coming up as like too slow. And we ran the flame charts. We ran this thing and we'd start to see some really weird stuff. In particular, we had this one function, uh, this, this parse HTML that ended up on my computer taking around 400 to 700 milliseconds. And on other computers, like, like if we simulate like slow down CPU, it could take up to three seconds. And, it, and what it was doing 
I feel like, does anyone have any idea what would be causing, calling parse HTML and taking that long, you know, multiple seconds? Any ideas? What, what that even, like, well, what's happening there? It was reading the current DOM to the side of the page. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is this is not that. So this is jQuery.load. How many of you have used jQuery.load? It's the sickest API. You pass in like a selector for a DOM node, and you send it a URL. It will go to that URL, download all the HTML, and just shove it into your page. Now, the funny thing is. Amazon for a long time, this particular team had some internal, this particular team I should say, had some internal guidance. Don't use templating engines, templating engines are slow. Get your HTML on the server, shove it into the DOM. Sounds good, here's how they were doing it. Every single item in your list, let's say you had 200 rows or 40 rows, um, had this little thing called fee, I can't even read it, fee preview. I know it's blurry, I couldn't get proper image. I couldn't like, it's like an internal, like not internal site, but it's like, I had to find some like public <laughs> pictures of it. Um, so it has this fee preview button. You click it and it's like a little modal with like taxes and stuff that you have to pay on your product. So this seems kind of normal, but the way they did it was they like after the site loads, they go and call to um, make this call to jQuery and like and, and load all the modals for the page. So if there are 40 pages, there are 40 uh, rows, they, they get 40 of these items and inject it into the DOM. Second weird thing, they have this debug panel at the bottom. This is only for internal developers. But what they do is they'd, anytime you made like an Ajax call, they'd include all this like metadata with it. So what happened was, what you were getting was two megabytes of HTML and a various like metadata coming in being injected into the DOM. So like, it doesn't matter like how good your computer is, like two megabytes of stuff like shoving through basically like dot inner HTML equals and this just massive pile of data, it's gonna be super slow because it actually has to parse all that data and do all these things. So it's a combination of, we had some debug data there for internal users, so only I would have seen that really. And all the different rows, like pulling in the modal dialogue for every single row that didn't need it. So what, here's what happened. If you, you basically loaded the page, and the page was like more or less ready, it should have been uh, sort of calling our time to interactive, which is like when the site's ready, because this is all stuff that you don't need. This is kind of below the fold type of information. But um, because it, 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 the, um, the DOM was so busy loading all this stuff, it didn't actually fire our time to interactive till after that whole long jQuery load thing happened. So it was a really interesting, we had a lot of discussions about like, is it even slow? Because it's like, yes, it would basically block the DOM for 500 milliseconds, but it's like, that happens like a second after your page is sort of ready to use. So it's kind of a weird way that it was slowing things down. Um, now, if we, if we were using largest contentful paint, it probably would have flagged here and our site would have been flagged as fast anyway, because it was mostly server rendered and most of the stuff was kind of happening behind the scenes. But it was an interesting um, example of how uh, old tools can lead to really sort of unexpected results. And it does get worse. This debug panel that we had for internal users only had all these charts and fancy stuff and it took an additional 600 kilobytes of JavaScript. You know, have you ever used like high charts or some of these things? So, so we pulled in all these libraries just for our internal devs, but it came packaged with the whole package that everyone got, right? So, not only were we loading a bunch of stuff that was off screen, slowing everyone down, we we're also loading all this debug, uh, this, this cool like debug processing stuff and making everyone suffer the cost of that, even if they weren't using that stuff. So thoughts about legacy code. Start with a performance inspector. It'll, it will tell you all the secrets. Like, like even if it's hard to understand, I could have done a whole thing about like hieroglyphics. Like it's, it's weird, it's confusing, but like it will show you what's going on with the performance inspector. And then like, don't ship code that your users can't use. So it's really bad to load 40 modal dialogues and inject them into the DOM when like your users aren't likely to use them. Like wait until they click on one and just load the one, whatever. Um, and then finally, or wait till they're hovering over the one and then just preload the single one. And this is kind of the thought that I thought of that I think was kind of clever and worth as a takeaway, which is, your mistakes often outweigh whatever good architecture you have. Like if you said like, hey, I'm server side rendering this thing. Yeah, it's Java server pages, but it's pretty fast. Time the first bytes quick. I'm using jQuery. It's like, 
I'm lazy loading the stuff. Like you could say that and you could tell, you could convince most people that it's a good architecture. Like it's a fast architecture, it's maybe older, but like your mistakes, your small mistakes, like including the debug data and debug code and doing weird stuff with modals, like that can actually outweigh your good architecture decisions. And so this is, this is back to my main point again of like, if you think that like switching architectures is gonna solve your problems, like you're probably gonna make mistakes that, that make the architecture change not necessarily as big of a deal. So like focus on um, cleaning up what you have rather than just like throwing away and starting over. So even though I did like recommend them to move to React, to be honest, because it was so impossible to work with their old code base. Next thing, let's talk about this one, which I'm calling creepy crawlies. Um, it's kind of like a corny name, but like the idea of like little things that kind of make your website slower. Um, they kind of get in there and, and mess with your stuff. So back to this particular page I was telling you about uh, where you add, add your products. We got told that we had to use a new component library. Now remember, we already had two component UI libraries in there. We had a third one that was the one we were actually supposed to be using. And then we got told, actually, you need to bring in this additional one. It uses web components, uses whatever new stuff. And we noticed when we started bringing this in, every time we started typing, like, so we sort of brought it in like piecemeal, like half the fields are one, half the fields are the other. And every time you started typing into one of the fields from the old library, the new library was just start like, like rendering, rendering, updating, like you could see it like flashing. Um, it was very stressful. Um, obviously a horrible user experience. We didn't actually ship it, of course. Um, but eventually it became so slow, uh, it, it was essentially like unusable. Um, so that's why I think of like, as we start typing your name, I record this in performance, uh, the performance inspector, and it'd be like, you know, 75 milliseconds like per keystroke for it to render. So it's like stuttering the whole way through. Uh, and this is what I mean by the creepy crawlies. They're just like slowing you down. They're in your code or they're in your stuff. They're making it bad. Um, and tabs, like when you switch between different tabs, uh, I don't know why my slides went crazy. It, it would take a super long, long time to deal with that. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so this is another thought. Web performance measures the difference between the user's intentions and their productivity. So I want to do a thing. I want to click a button and, and I can't do it. I want to load a web page and it takes this long to do it. So there's something about thinking about, it's not just how long it takes to load a page, but it's how long it takes from a user to want to do a thing to being able to actually achieve the thing that they're trying to do. Um, and so when we're thinking about optimization, we have to think like multiple facets, but it really comes down to user experience and how the user is being stopped from doing the thing that they're trying to accomplish. So let's get back to the code here. We had this web component that was very bad. People always say, oh, web components use the platform faster than React. So we had a React app. We brought in this UI library with web components, it had a bug. Every time you add every single item in a uh, drop down took about one millisecond to render. You're like, millisecond, like who cares? So fast. But the thing is, some of the things that we have to ask, oh, hold on, pizza people. Tell us how your order went with pizza pilgrims. Stop okay. <laughs> um, so every time the, uh, uh, like we had this field that we were required to add um, in the state of California, particularly in the state of California, where, which listed out every single possible chemical known to cause cancer. Um, so remember, one second per option. Um, we had then 732 options uh, in this particular field uh, about all the cancers that you could possibly get. And because a thing could be made up of more than one chemical, we had four of those on a page. So at one point it took over two seconds just to change between tabs on, on the website. And uh, even more than that, like, we would have, uh, we, we had this thing where we wanted to add validation uh, constantly. Like we just really wanted to make sure people weren't typing in bad things. So every time you change tabs <coughs> or, or blurred on a thing, we'd revalidate the field and make sure it was an error. And, and so what we noticed is that in order to accomplish that validation, we were firing off 80 Redux actions per tab change. How many of you using Redux or have used Redux in the past? Controversial tool, still pretty widely used though. Um, one really important principle of using Redux is that you should only send off like one, well, first of all, don't keep form data in Redux, and two, um, send off one action 
and let that be processed by multiple reducers. Don't send off many, 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 many actions. But I didn't really know that, and I helped write some of this bad code, so whatever. Now I have a course on Redux after I learned all the, all the problems <laughs> to fix it. Um, but yeah, we were just sending validation for every single, you imagine we have 80 form fields. Every time you switch tabs, I'm sending off 80 validation events in Redux. Oh my gosh. Uh, when we open up the Redux like inspector, like the dev tool, it literally crashed because it couldn't handle that much, um, that many actions coming through. So yeah, keep your keep your um, form state out of Redux, please. Use React Hook form or something else. And then in addition on this, we're also misusing the key attribute. Key attribute is really cool. If you're in, if you're doing React, like study the key attribute. It can, um, if you set a key, it can change the key, it will force that particular component and all its children to re-render. It's really, really cool. There's a lot of really interesting things you can do for, um, for you know, breaking sort of caches and things like that. It, it, it's pretty interesting, but we were misusing it. So every time you change tabs, it was forcing re-render of all these components, even though the, many of the components stayed, stayed the same or didn't need to be uh, re-rendered. So there's all these bad things we were doing. And it just made it like really, really slow. Um, so point being, I'm a bad programmer, but more importantly, we need to learn how to measure all these sort of creepy crawly things. So you, you, you've got your web performance inspector, but the stupid thing is, if you're using React, and I think we raised hands earlier, many, many, many of you are using React, it, it like, instead of saying like what component is taking this long, it just says like, oh, React underscore underscore lifestyle underscore whatever is taking this long. And it doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's like impossible to read. So while for legacy stuff, that's like normal JavaScript, performance inspector is amazing. But when you're doing stuff with React, you really need to learn React developer tools and use the profiler. How many of you use this profiler? Okay, so you probably, many of you seen it, but I wanna just like, let's see if any of this stuff works. Yeah, the animation stuff. So you can click in, you can see what props are being passed. You can see what state exists. And then there's this concept at the top. Let's see if this works. So you can click in, it shows how much, many milliseconds it, it takes to render each component. And like, it'll tell you with color coding if your component is slow or not, which is very nice. Like green is good, yellow, meh. Um, and then there's a thing here. This is the most important concept of it. I'm just gonna just walk over here. These are the different commits. Um, like the actual, uh, like when React actually renders to the DOM. So if you press the arrows, you go through the different commits and you can see like every single one of the, the commits to the DOM that it makes. And um, it will show you like with the height there and the color, which of those commits are slow. So if you, if you do one thing, like I just click a button, yeah. And then the button, you, you might see like seven different commits and you're like, oh, it's re-rendering a lot of different things. So, so there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do here, it's super important. There's also other ways to measure that. There's some interesting tools from Chrome DevTools that they're working on. There's some, uh, a new metric called interaction to next paint, which measures the time when you do a thing to when the, when like the next, uh, the screen updates basically. So it tries to figure out if there's like a big lag between you trying to do stuff and having some sort of indicator showing that things happen. They've also been working with, um, with uh, something called soft navigation. So you know when you have like a, we're using something like React Router and you can update the URL without having to actually change the page, but like it updates the code and updates the URL without like reloading the page. Those are super hard to measure traditionally. Like largest contemptible paint only shows the first time it loads. So there, there's experiment with soft navigations that will help us figure out, okay, after the page loads, is it still slow after that? And my, we had a lot of talk about this before in my work of like, does it matter? Like once someone's on your thing, are they gonna keep using it even if it's like sluggish? And like, think about it. Yesterday, okay, how many of you, do any of you collect records? Cool, cool, cool crowd, this guy. Okay, so, so I, um, I collect records. I'm from Seattle, it's like a music city. It's kind of like my thing. And um, London has a lot of amazing record stores. A famous one here is Rough Trade. It's just right over there on Brick Lane. And uh, it's record store day last week. And they have like, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but it's, it's related. They have like a lot of cool records like that are uh, special releases, Susie and the Banshees and uh, Blur and Taylor Swift record. 
um, and all these great records and that are like limited releases just for record store day and I couldn't be bothered to go out on Saturday and like wait in line for two hours like six in the morning to get these records but they said they'd be on the website last night at eight o'clock. Uh, so I get on the website last night at eight o'clock, website loads fine, click add to cart and nothing happens. Um, then I finally got it to add to cart and I couldn't actually check out. And I'm like, I'm going to give you a hundred pounds for three records. It's not even a good deal, but I want them. They're limited and it didn't work. And I tried back about 10 times. So yeah, I do think that slow interactions are important to measure because I got fed up and I didn't buy the records and I was going to go today before the meetup. It was a whole thing. I couldn't get over there. And I just have to like be cool about that. I did get the Taylor Swift one from like a different record store, but it was like a whole thing. So React Dev Tool Profiler is essential. And you gotta like set limits. Like what we started doing is we're like, yeah, we got these tab changes, you know? And we had like, you have to think about like how annoying, like at what point is someone gonna be so mad at my website that they're gonna leave? Like you have to start measure, like thinking in terms of how slow is this interactivity allowed to be? Like, at what point is this too slow? And, and, and set these things. And then you can set up custom metrics. Like, you, you can't even necessarily use magic tools like this. Like, like if South, South Navigation comes through, that might be really, really cool because it'll be kind of like automated. You might have to set up custom metrics to start measuring stuff. We started doing that on the last team at Amazon where we would say like, okay, we want to measure how long it takes to switch the tab. So from, from clicking on the thing, we'll fire up a beacon. When the page loads, we'll fire up. And then we could actually start seeing what, how people are experiencing tab changes in real life. So as much as possible, automate these measurements. It's fun to do my own recording. We did that in some cases. We said, look, this is too hard to automate measuring. So like, we're just gonna be like, if, if on my computer it's slower than 300 milliseconds, we know it's bad. We're gonna, we're gonna like prioritize fixing it. So, but so the idea of like having SLAs not only for page loading, but for page interactions, I feel like is a thing that we need to like, embrace more in the community. Okay, I feel <laughs> that I've gone too far on this talk. It's taking too long, but I did want to add one more monster to the list. This is a weird mid-journey picture. I took the uh, web page test output of like, and I, I told it to merge it with a monster. And so like, this is like a weird profiler monster thing. I don't know, it's pretty creepy. Um, this is why I'm calling the monster hiding under the stairs. And what I mean by the stairs, of course, is that um, like jagged performance waterfall of the network. And what is this about? So when you have your browser, you can open up the network tab and you can see how long certain things takes to load. And you can filter it by like just at, uh, XHR or fetch requests. You can filter it by JavaScript. And, and what I've noticed for single page applications, any, any website that's not server-side rendered, any like Jamstack apps, anything like that, where you load a site, then you have this like loading spinner while you're waiting for your data to come in. This is a very common pattern. It's a bad pattern, but it's a very common pattern. And so I've learned to see this in, uh, in, in these types of charts. And you can also see the same thing in the performance tab. There's a network section there. It like is a little bit different and it's nice because you can kind of see like, in addition to the network calls, you can see like the performance stuff at the same time. Or you can use tools like web page test which you can stick in a URL and it's gonna give you the, the network waterfall. So I wanna show you this one quick thing and I'll, I will try to be quick about it because I've been, I've been going on a bit long. So this, is, this is kind of the basic thing I'm describing. You load your HTML, then you download your HTML, then you download your JavaScript, you process that, then you set up your loading spinner and you're like, okay, friends, you've waited a long time to get your JavaScript, now just here's a spinner for, you know, for fun. Um, and then the only one that was good, did, did, they, did they have that website here, Hipmunk? It's like a, it's like a travel website. And I had this like happy little chipmunk that was like dancing for the loading spinner. And like, I loved it. I was like, stay, come back chipmunk. Uh, so occasionally you can have a good spinner, but it's rare. And then once you get, once you get the data back, you usually have to process the data and then it will be rendered and then your page ready. So things to look at if you see this pattern in your apps, okay? First thing is look at your main call for data on your site. Like let's say it's a GraphQL call or whatever. You can look at this thing and says in, in your network tab and it's called timing. And you see when it's queued and when it started. So that is basically saying, when did you ask for the data? 
And I've seen websites where this is literally like one second. So it's like, you didn't even ask for the data to render your website until a second after your website loaded. Like you're just a bad website. Um, and if you click into it, it also shows how long the thing is. So yeah, this is a real, this is like legit. This is a real example. Queued at 1.2 seconds. And then the call itself took two seconds. So you're like, I'm not even gonna ask you for a long time. And then I'm gonna be really slow. Like this is a recipe for making your customers angry. And, and so when you run the, run the thing, you'll see this, there's often this giant block where you're just waiting for your data to come back. I mean, right? This is all JavaScript processing. This is just like, do -do -do, I'm doing nothing. And then this is more like your, your thing actually rendering. The, the screenshots up here don't, don't do a great job. The way that, when, when I was at Amazon before, like I said, we used Time to Interactive. Time to Interactive said, uh, I'm gonna wait until JavaScript is not busy for 500 milliseconds, this is a particular version of it, for 500 milliseconds, and when, it, and when the, the JavaScript is not busy for 500 milliseconds, uh, and we know that the, the page is basically loaded, I'm gonna assume that we're done. So it would, on this page, uh, the, the, the form page that I was talking about before, it would go about here and say, I think your page is ready here. The screenshot would show a big loading spinner. So when I joined the team, uh, we were all green on our web performance metrics because we were looking at Times Interactive and because of this giant lag in waiting for our data to come, the JavaScript was like perfect here. Like if you want to interact with that loading spinner, you could click on it, you could do whatever you want. It would just be, you know, it would be very eager to go. But the, if you looked at largest contentful paint or some of the other metrics that actually show like when there's stuff on the page, it's not going to be till like four seconds later. So this, this is like a giant fight of me like fighting my team to be like, actually, I, I, I'm sorry that it says that we're green and you're in good, like you're not in trouble, but actually we're really bad at, at this website and we should feel bad about ourselves. It was a big fight. I, I eventually won and I got them to change the metric to use largest contemplative paint and it was a whole thing, but it was like a lot of fighting. So this is gonna be very quick on how to solve this problem if you have it in your app. And you probably have this problem in your app, so start measuring it now. The first thing you need to do is decouple data loading from React render lifecycle. I know you're not all using React, but just like, you get the vibe of this, okay? Instead of like waiting for your component to render and like during the render, do we use the fact which happens after the render to start loading the data, you need to start loading the data separately of rendering the data. Like start loading the data as soon as you can. And if you use something like uh, React Router 6 loaders, they do this. If you use, um, there's, there's in fact, like Apollo has a way to do it. It's called prefetching, a React query, all these different tools you might be using. But if you're rolling your own stuff like I usually do, I end up making this mistake a lot. And so if you see it in your um, network waterfall, think, okay, how do I decouple? The next thing is, so, so that will take you, if you decouple, your, your loading uh, from the React render lifecycle, that means it'll start loading it faster. So you go from here to something like this, where you know earlier in the JS processing, it doesn't wait till everything's rendered to start kicking off the king, it'll request it. So this might save you like 50 milliseconds. But then, as soon as you get here, you start to get greedy and think, okay, can we do better? And there is a better way, right? You wanna go earlier, you wanna, you want to start, basically you want your data to start loading as soon as your JavaScript. Why should it load separately? And there is like a thing, there's like a thing that Chrome provides and there's like articles about it called link rel equals preload. Anyone use this? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is like the proper way to do it, but I tell you, I've never gotten this to work once in my life, like properly. Like, because if you're loading, like you're doing GraphQL, it's a post call, it doesn't even work with a post call. It used to not only like not work with fetch or only SHR, it's just like, it will get there, but it's hard. And some frameworks will get it for you automatically. But what I usually end up doing, seems a little wild, is I create a script called preload, a script called main, and then in my preload script, I just start loading the data and shove it on like a global variable. This is like, seems sketchy, but the idea is, Oh, and then in my React code, I'll just reference the global variable. And it's like, people are like, people on the team, like they look at the code and they're like, I don't know if you should do this. And I'm like, do it, it's good. Uh, because what happens is you start from here um, and then you get here where you have like a loader script or something. And then so while your JavaScript is downloading, your data is also downloading. You don't need to wait until your whole JavaScript, everyone now with the JavaScript bundles, nine megabytes, okay? You don't want to wait nine megabytes and then start loading the data. You want your data to load as soon as your, JavaScript, uh, your, your, your HTML is ready. And then while that giant JavaScript bundle is processing, 
your data is loading, and by the time it's actually ready to render, it can render. Also wrote a blog post about this, uh, which you can read. It's very nice uh, on my Dev2 blog. Um, but my, my basic takeaways for slaying this monster, start loading data as soon as possible. Paralyze data loading with script loading. Don't think, oh, can I load this earlier in my script? Yeah, but like, why wait till your script loads? Your script is too big. And doing that, oh, sorry, you wanna go back? Oh, oh no, I keep pressing the wrong back button. And I have too many animations. Is this the one? I don't know, whatever. Oh no, it was this one. Those are the only two like notes. Okay, so this is how we kill the monster hiding under the stairs. Uh, with that. And, sorry, too many animations, blah, 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 blah. Defeated all the monsters. I'm actually gonna cut the last like 10 slides because I'm kind of like, I think we've had our time and it's been good. Um, but the idea is this, I'll summarize the last little bit. Your website is slow. You don't wanna wait for your customers to start complaining. You don't want them to, you don't wanna put up a little hotline. Hey, put a little feedback here. If my website's slow, like tell me. You know, you don't need the phone number. Like, call me and tell me that it's bad. You need to have monitoring. This is from Jurassic Park. They monitor where all of their um, dinosaurs are, okay? Where the monsters are. You need to know before your customers that the website is slow. Uh, there's tools like Core Web Vitals, there's, um, uh, which, which, which measure this in a pretty sophisticated way. If your website's fairly popular, you can look at, um, Oh, sorry, or you can use tools like Lighthouse to run this on your own computer, but your own computer is not the computer that your customers are doing, um, right? Lighthouse is a lab test, meaning it's run in a controlled environment. You need to understand how your users are experiencing your site in the field. Um, and that's called ROM, real user monitoring. There are tools like Chrome user experience dashboard. If your website is popular, this is wild to me. They just like, you know how like in Chrome it says like send statistics, like how things are, like, People just like, it'll automatically just like uh, take all this data. You can put it in any URL of like a popular website and it'll just like tell you how fast it is. Like you can just put it in right there. Even if it's like, uh, these are only public sites though. So there's, there's limited utility you can get in this, but you can start with like something like Chrome UX dashboard to understand how your site is. You can use tools like Sentry.io or third-party tools. AWS, CloudWatch RUM for people interested in AWS. Um, that, that can also uh, measure this stuff for you and help you understand how your customers are experiencing the site so that they don't have to complain about it or you're like, better is like when your VP is like, hey, I tried to use your website and it was very bad, what's going on? And you have to like do all this sort of thing. You don't even know about that, it's embarrassing. So last slide, maintaining high performance web apps is about culture, right? It's not about, oh, I'm not using the latest technology. It's about like putting in the time, teaching your, team, all the secrets and tools that they need to use, monitoring the stuff, and, and being in a way where you're ready to solve the performance problems uh, before your customers can start complaining about them. So that's it, thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs>